house of the Lord today, and we are with that spirit. Hearts are mended and troubles vanish when you get in the confines and the presence of God's spirit. And it's that spirit that lives within us. But when we synergize in the spirit, just the power, the potency of what God can do is available. And it just takes faith. Regardless of what your week has been and maybe what lies ahead of you, we don't know that part. We just know what has passed us. But things will come this week that could bring stress and pressure and frustration. But we're starting the week off right. Great Sundays make better Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And so I commend you for being in the house of the Lord. Watch this on the Lord's Day. On the Lord's Day. Putting God first at the first part of my day and the first part of my week. And God descends upon my life and your life. And so to that, I say thank you for being here. Amen. It's an honor to have our friends with us. Brother and Sister David Tipton and his lovely wife is traveling with him. Very good friend of mine. And to kind of put it in the context of who he is and how our churches work, he's, I will say it this way, in a public or secular term, he's the highest ranking official within our organization for the state of Mississippi. We call them district superintendents. You might call them a district uh, state superintendent, which he kind of oversees and manages and brings growth to 200 churches and 400 preachers and ministers. And I tell you that because the value that he brings to this pulpit, I'm so honored that he could speak to our church. I want him to meet, meet you, and I want you to meet him. And amen, He's, he has an incredible testimony and he just has been with us the last couple of days, and I feel like I'm a better person and a better pastor and those that were with us that he poured himself into. So my, to my friend, Brother Tipton, God bless you for being here. Please come minister to us. Tell us what the Lord told you. Uh, he's from Mississippi, so listen closely. But anyway, I mean, he, he, he's he got some good nuggets to say, but le- you might have to lean in a few times, and if I jump up here to interpret it, I don't want to distract him in Jesus' name. As I begin to speak, you will realize I am not from Southern California. I am from Mississippi. And wow, what an introduction. Uh, As you was bragging on me, I was thinking, man, with an introduction like that, I can't wait to hear what I've got to say. (laughs) Pray. (laughs) Hey, man, I'm honored to be here with my wife, uh, the first lady of our district, Gwen Tipton, and to be here this weekend. I'll read my text in just a moment, but I want to give accolades to your pastor. We have been friends for many, many years and served on a couple of boards together nationally. And uh, I read recently where there are four people you need in your life, and that's a banker, an actor, a preacher, and a mortician. One for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know so much about the banker and actor. They're ev- the actors are everywhere. A mortician, who cares when you're gone, you won't know. But you do need a minister or a pastor in your life. And if you're here today and this is your first time as a guest, amen, brother and sister Durant's would be great to serve you as your pastor. And they have people at heart and they want to help you. Amen. I'll quickly uh, get into the word of God again, brother Lee Blair mentioned and had the veterans to stand and let me personally uh, I'm a patriotic American and I'm honored to be in the company of people that serve in our military so thank you as we celebrate Veterans Day Amen if you will and have your Bible or read on the screen I will ask you to open your hearts and your Bibles to Luke the 18th chapter I want to commend the praise team, the musicians, for ushering us into the presence. A job well done. Awesome. Amen. Amen. Now, it's a dangerous thing to go to sleep while God is moving. Adam went to sleep single and woke up married. So, if you're awake, You may have a motive. If you go to sleep, you may have a motive. I don't know. (laughs) Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning at verse 1. 
And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him and saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. Let me stop right there and tell you, some things take time. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wear me out, or she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, or in spite of, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I'm going to speak to you on this subject. A faith that does not quit. A faith. Oh, let's praise him. Let's worship. Praise God. And if you're going to help me preach, you may be seated. And if you stand, that's something we can do together. <laughs> Amen. Now, there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> and I hope just before I get to that line, I will stop. But I do have in my heart a message today to speak to somebody about a faith that will not quit. You probably heard the ridiculous story about the man who was refused entry, entry into a fancy dinner club because he wasn't wearing a tie. The doorman sent him away with instructions to return if and only if he had wrapped around his neck a tie or his tie. So the fellow rummaged through his car and the glove compartment and, and couldn't find the necktie. And however, he, he did find a pair of jumper cables in the trunk of his vehicle. So he decided to fashion a necktie from those jumper cables. And he returned to the door of the club and the doorman saw those jumper cables around the man's neck and realized that technically they could serve as a tie. So he said, well, I guess you can come in, but then he added, just don't start anything. <laughs> Bad joke. But here is where we want to begin today's message. The people in history who have most impacted our lives were people who were determined to start something. People of faith who refuse to take no for an answer. On August the 3rd, 1970, 62-year-old Miriam Hargrave of Yorkshire, England, finally passed her driving test. It was her 40th attempt. After so much struggle and perseverance, one would assume she would start driving right away, but Unfortunately, after spending so much money on driving lessons, she couldn't afford to buy a car. Maybe it's just as well. I mean, how comfortable would you be knowing that the driver coming at you had failed her driving test 40 times? Another citizen from Britain, his name is David Guest, and you can Google his name. Actually, he's a minister. He required 632 lessons over a period of 17 years before he passed his driving test. When I was told I passed my test, I bent down on my knees and thanked God. 
The 33-year-old cleric had spent $11,000 on lessons, wore out eight instructors, and crashed five cars before the momentous accomplishment. The secret to his turnaround, he finally switched to a car with automatic transmission. His problems stem from the inability to distinguish between the clutch and the brake while driving a car with manual transmission. We admire people who refuse to give up, who refuse to cut their losses. Usually I read around every May, April, May, or June of a 60, 70, 80-year-old man or woman who because of extenuating circumstances, perhaps their parents were killed and they were oldest of the siblings and they had to put their dreams aside and raise their younger siblings. And it, invariably, I get joy of watching a video clip of a 60 or 70-year-old man get to walk across the stage and graduate with 21, 22, 23-year-olds because even though life uh, had them to put their dreams forward, they still said, I'm going back to get my degree. I'm going back and I have a faith that will not quit. Amen. I believe today as I'm enjoying the beautiful sunny weather of Southern California, I believe God sent me here today just a, a, a country boy from Mississippi to encourage you and to let you hear a message today. I believe the word of God is simple for us this morning. It's just this. Hang in there. Don't you give up. Keep going. You're going to make it. You've got what it takes to win. Somebody ought to shout, I'm going to make it. I will not give up. I will not give in. I've got a faith that refuses to quit. Jesus told a story about an unjust judge. This judge said Jesus had no fear of God and cared even less about what other people might think of him. He took bribes. And gave favors to persons who held positions and authority. He didn't worry about conscience or law. About morality or justice. He was out obviously to fill his pockets and to gain honor. Because the Bible called him the unjust judge. And, and recognition from those who held positions of power and wealth. But there was a widow who needed his help. She was poor. She had no money to bribe him, even if that were her inclination. She was a widow, a woman all alone in a man's world. She had no man and no money to secure legal counsel to plead her case. She had no position or authority, none of the necessary clout to commend her to the judge. Yes, she was being persecuted. She was being taken advantage of and abused by an unknown adversary. Still, with all the odds against her and the woman in a man's world and everything that opposed her, she let none of this stop her. Time and time again, she kept coming to the judge with her plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. Avenge me of my adversary. Everywhere he looked and everywhere he went, there she was. Grant me justice. Oh, help me out, judge. And at first, the judge responded with silence. He didn't make a move to help her. His heart was hard and harsh. He had no interest in helping anyone who would not benefit his career or fill his pockets. Oh, but the poor widow kept on knocking, kept on pleading. Let me just use a little imagination and supposition. Uh, I mean, the, the judge is getting up and he's having breakfast and he's sitting at the breakfast nook and, and, and he's sitting there eating a bowl of Cheerios and there's a knock on the window pane and, and he opens the Venetian blind and there she stands, a uh, little widow woman. Uh, and, and she's kind of slumped shoulders and she's kind of weary and, and her, her face and her countenance has, has a, a worried look and needing some help and a reprieve. And she knocks on the window and he reads her lips and she says, grant me justice. Avenge me of my adversary. He shoes her away as though she's a stray dog and tells her to leave him alone. I'm just kind of letting you know because the Bible says she was persistent. And, and so he gets, in his, he, he gets in his clothes and he goes out the back garage and he gets in his chariot and he's got white uh, horses and oh, he's got a chariot with baby moon hubcaps and he's headed to the courthouse. 
he gets to the courthouse and all of a sudden the bailiff steps out and says, hear ye, hear ye, the honorable or dishonorable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the judge walks forward he stand, and all of a sudden on the front row in the courthouse is this same woman uh, he goes to the grocery store he goes to Walmart everywhere he turns this woman will not leave me alone she would not let him rest hmm. so the judge did not fear God he didn't regard man's opinions <laughs> yet he finally gave in to the widow and gave her justice that she was seeking. Why? Because she would not give up. He could not get rid of her. She would not. Amen. The presence of the Lord is here speaking to somebody that perhaps even this week was on the verge and contemplating thoughts. I just don't see how I can make it work. Don't give up. She would not accept silence. She wouldn't take no for an answer. She was persistent. And the judge finally said, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. Now, let me stop right now. I am not teaching a lesson on pestering. <laughs> this is not about being a pester. This is a lesson on faith. And faithfulness. Faith and faithfulness. Because faith does not ignore facts. It just rolls up its sleeves. And regardless of the facts, says, I'm going to war. Hallelujah. And I'm going to prayer. And I'm going to believe God. I know my situation is dismal. I know it doesn't, it looks impossible, but I got a God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. Imagine, imagine that a judge, a man of tremendous power in the community, but he finally cowered by this poor widow. This widow was persistent. She refused to let this corrupt judge go. And it's one of those quirky little parables that Jesus loved to tell. But he adds a very serious moral to it. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Hallelujah. I am here to believe, and I feel a little prophetic utterance, that somebody, is your answer is on the way, and it's even closer than you think, and you have tried, and you have prayed, and you didn't see how it's going to work out, but God is about to make a way where there seemeth no way. Hallelujah. I believe the words that I preached to you this morning that we read in the Holy Writ uh, were for people who are suffering unjustly for their faith, for people that need a breakthrough, uh, for people that need a healing. Uh, is there anybody in here uh, that I can encourage and bring a, a little hope today? Hang in there. Uh, he was saying, hang in there. God hears your prayers. Hang in there. Trust in him. You will not be disappointed. It's important to keep trusting God no matter what your situation and that's a major part of the meaning of faith the story is told in the Old Testament and it came to pass at the seventh time he said behold <laughs> now if you look at verse 43 it tells us and said to his servant go up now look toward the sea and he went up and he looked and said, there is nothing. And he said, go look again. Seven times. And verse 44 said, and it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there ariseth a cloud out of the sea, like a, not much, like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say to Ahab. Get your chariot ready and get down because it's about to be a gully washer. Hello, folks. <laughs> and so here's, it's been a drought for three years. People have given up. 
everyone's thirsty. The cattle, the animals are dehydrated. And then all of a sudden, the elder, the man of God said to an assistant, God had spoken to the elder. He knew that God, he was the one that prayed the prayer and shut the heavens up. I believe the elder had a word from God, but he was demonstrating to a young minister, listen, you don't ever give up. And he sent him seven times. He would go one time and look and come back. And the elder would say, well, what do you see? And he said, there is nothing. Now, how many times have you prayed and you got up from your prayer room or your prayer closet and you got up and you felt in your heart when you began to pray that you would get an answer from God and you got up and you still, and you went out to face the world and you could still say, there's nothing. There is nothing. And so he went two times, three times. About the fifth time, wouldn't you think the young man would probably say, you know what, I think the elders got Alzheimer's. I mean, I told him five times ago, there's nothing. How, how much of nothing does he not understand? Zilda. Uh, what you call, na, uh, nada. Zilch. Zero. Nothing. Let, let me encourage this church and anyone here today. Here, if I do not get an answer... Shall I pray again? Whew, somebody shout yes. yes. Hear me this morning. There is always the seventh time of faith that does not quit. Now, earlier this morning, and I reviewed this, and this scripture really, I enjoyed reading to you from the New Testament and the Old Testament here, but this is a scripture that is very, uh, Habakkuk is, is very seldom preached from. But I felt like this was a word not only collectively for this church, but I feel like that it is for some individuals here. And the, the uh, prophet Habakkuk learned this, and he exhorts in chapter 2 and verse 3, would you let this, I just feel, I'm not letting this be your mission statement, I'm not suggesting all that, but I believe this is the word of God for this church this moment. Amen. Why don't let's read it aloud together. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it. <laughs> Somebody will shout, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I know what they said. I know what I've heard. I know the doctor's report. I know they said I wouldn't get the job. I know they said I wouldn't get the rest. But I know somebody. And he can. I said he can because he's able. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Feel the Holy Ghost. So shall we pray again? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Abraham did. Abraham prayed six times about the righteous in Sodom. In Sodom, he started with 50 in increments of 10. He prayed and he prayed. I'm not here to change the word of God. I'm only just, I'm inquisitive. And I'm knowing that there were the value of seven. They marched around the wall of Jericho seven times. And then on the seventh day, seven times. And, 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 and there's other times where seven's in the Bible. And I can only find what Abraham prayed six times. And I just wonder, not trying to change scripture, I, I can't change anything, but, but what might have happened if he had prayed the seventh time? Because let me ask you something. The Bible said the angels rejoice when what? Ten? Oh, we're praying for ten. He got down to ten and quit praying. When there may be that one that could be the answer for the multiplication to 10 or 20 or 50 soul revival. There could be one person in your family that could ignite and spark a revival in this town like you've never seen. So don't we quit. We don't stop praying at 10. That one is just as important because it could be the key to revival. It could be the key to your family. And the angels rejoice. Hey, when one sinner doesn't get the Holy Ghost, yes, he does, but just when he repents. And the scripture tells us that it's not his will that any, and any can be one. 
that any should perish. Oh, help me preach here a little bit here today. So I'm trying to tell you, there may be one that you've given up on, but I'm here to encourage you today, go again, go again. Oh, you may come back and say, Pastor, there's nothing. But Pastor, say, go again. There's always the seventh time. Jesus himself said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. That is, when he said faint, that's quit short of the goal. Don't do that. Elijah prayed a short prayer of less than 60 seconds and fire fell and consumed the sacrifice at Mount Carmel. The very same day, he prayed and prayed and prayed again for rain. Now, let me ask you a question. Was he any less spiritual when he prayed for rain than when he prayed for fire? Just keep praying till the light breaks through. The Lord will answer. He will answer you. God keeps his promise. His word is true. Just keep on praying till the light breaks through. Somebody shout, just keep on praying. praying. Amen. This picture that's before you is very significant in my life. In 1988, My wife and I and our two sons went to Salt Lake City, Utah to attend General Conference. We went in a couple days early so we could tour. And, uh, again, I'm from Florida, so I've seen, born there, I've seen little snow and a few mountains. So it it was a great trip. And we rented a vehicle, and we went out near Snowbird, and and, uh, this was just kind of a secret desire of mine that I'd always wanted to climb a mountain. Now, I'm not a mountain climber. I didn't have any gear to climb mountains. In fact, I had casual clothes and regular shoes. And, but I told my wife and my two sons, I said, listen, would y'all let me go y'all? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, anybody ever heard y'all? Okay, so I'm okay then. All right, now, in yeah, Oklahoma, Mississippi, or Alabama is y'all. Now, the plural for y'all is all y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Giving y'all an English, Mississippi English lesson. <laughs> I'm glad y'all just love me for who I, who I am. So anyway, <laughs> amen. So I said to my wife and sons, uh, my oldest was eight, my youngest was six. I said, would y'all be patient with me and let me go out there? And I didn't pick out the tallest mountain. I had better sense than that. <laughs> but I just picked out a, a, a kind of a short mountain. And I said, I would just, I have a, I've always wanted to as a child climb a mountain. Now, I know that it, you would go to the Guinness Book of Records, it's, my name's not going to be there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not going to be in some famous archive where you can go back and say, wow, he climbed a mountain in Salt Lake City. But I picked my own mountain out and said, I'm going to climb it. Well, my oldest son is much like his mom, quiet and, and, and uh, studious. And actually, they brought books to read and... and, and uh, my youngest son's like me. I talk so much, my tongue is sunburned. <laughs> so, so, so uh, my, uh, my youngest son, who's daddy, 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 can I go with you? Well, I'm thinking, you know, I don't want to spend all day. I want to get up there as fast as I can and get back. And, but I said, you know what, yeah, yeah, come on. Come on, go with me. So he and I got out of the car, and we started walking. You know, about a quarter of the way, we sat down, took a break. And then we got up, and, you know, and slowly, and I had to stop and take breaks more often. <laughs> and, and, oh, my Lord. Ooh, I was much younger then. And I'm telling you, I got about halfway, and the back of my calves were burning. For some reason, I, thought, I didn't know I was a chain smoker, but my lungs are on fire. <laughs> oh, my word. <sighs> Of course, the air gets thinner, you know, the higher you go. And I'm like, whoo. And there were a couple times a thought ran through my mind. That happens to me occasionally. (laughs) 
a thought ran through my mind. You know what? You're up here. You're looking down there, and, and the car is getting smaller and smaller. Nobody will ever know you climb halfway. And I thought about doing that. But something come across me all of a sudden. I said, oh, no, no, no. You got your six-year-old son right here with you. You got your eight-year-old son and your wife down in the car. You told them you was going to climb a mountain. Now, there's not going to be an award for this, but the principle is this, is you told them you was going to do it, and you can't teach a, you've got to teach your son a principle that if you start out something, you've got to finish it. I'm almost through here, but somebody stay with me for just, who will give me five more minutes? Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20. Here's the problem. We got three-fourths of the way up. We sat down to take a break. I am hurting all over. My head is pounding. My lungs are burning. My calves are burning. I'm thinking, wow, why did I do this? I could have been downtown near the Mormon Tabernacle having an espresso. <laughs> and here's the problem. My six-year-old boy said to me, Daddy, I'm hurting. And I cannot go any farther. I said, oh, my. It's getting, it's getting more difficult here. I just said, you got to show your son you're not a quitter. And now he's hurting, and he's small, and, and he, he can't go any farther. I am a hero. <laughs> Somebody guessed it. I got my breath. I said, okay, we're going to do this, son. He said, come here. And I put him on my shoulders. He threw both legs around my neck. And weak and tired and in pain, I stood up. <laughs> it sounded a lot like that, too. <laughs> oh. I've got to teach my son uh, I'm not a quitter. I kind of felt like Ruth, if I perish, I perish. <laughs> and here, here, here I am. Now, that last 25%, I stopped frequently. I couldn't take but a few steps. I said, baby, we got to rest. Woo. I'd get him back up on my shoulder. You know what he'd say, Daddy, we're going to make it, aren't we? And I didn't slap him for saying that. <laughs> but I'm thinking, that's easy for you to say. We're going to make this. Yeah, we are, baby. And I did tell I said, yes, sir, son, we are going to, we're going to claim this mountain. This mountain in our mind will forever be the Tipton Mountain. We are going to claim this mountain. This mountain belongs to us. Because we, even though the last few steps I'm having to carry you, we're going to celebrate this victory together because we've got a faith that will not quit. The, the children are in Sunday school, aren't they? I wish I had a six-year-old boy. But just imagine with me. We get up there to the very top. We get to the very top of the mountain. And I, I was, I was hoping it was a six-year-old. Not I had one, but there was one in the building. <laughs> <laughs> I've got ten grandchildren, so, so, uh, so I got I, there's rocks everywhere, and so I, be, I bent down and I pulled him off my shoulder, and then I stood up and I grabbed him by the hand, and I wanted him to turn around and look. Ooh. And we were overlooking the entire Salt Lake Valley. And you know what he and I started doing? And I'm closing. In fact, I don't want you to stand. Because there's some people here today that you're the one climbing and you got someone on your shoulders. And there's other folks here today, you're the one on the shoulders. And you need to realize that we're going to make this together. Amen. The Bible said for the strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. That don't mean the strong is always strong and the weak's always weak. Today I may be strong, and I may need to take you on my shoulder and get you to tomorrow. But tomorrow I may be weak, and I may be fighting for my life. 
And I hope to God that you would say, Brother Tipton, let me, let me help you for a while because we will claim this mountain. And you and I are going to celebrate this victory together. Right. Hallelujah. Right. Come on, put your hands together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, the Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is here. The power of God is here. Come on, somebody, reach your hands to war heavens right now. Hallelujah. God is here in this place. Uh, is there anybody here that the Holy Ghost has spoke to and, 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 and spoke and confirmed the word uh, that you have been a little discouraged? Uh, oh, come on. And you've been tired. There's nothing wrong with getting tired. There's nothing wrong with sitting down a moment and getting your strength back. So I'm providing an opportunity for you to step forward and come down here and find some rest for your weary soul. Come on. Obey the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to be inhibited. There's people here that'll love you and pray for you and pray with you. Come on. Come on. Claim your mountain. Come on. Claim your mountain. There's a victory in the making this week for somebody in Temecula, California. Hello. It's just waiting for you to claim your mountain. You've got a faith that will not quit. Come on. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. Hallelujah. I have just begun to fight. I will pray one more time. I will fast one more meal. I'll believe God. Hallelujah. I'll kneel one more time. I'll pray one more time. And we're standing. 